like a circle in a spiral Like a wheel within a wheel Never ending or beginning Like the circles that you find In the windmills of your Visit stogiegeeks.com forward slash debonair for a list of retailers who carry debonair cigars. Buy some today and get a little more debonair. Welcome back to the Stogie Geek Show. Will Cooper here with Dave Burke, um, and this is the debonair ideal segment. Um, so, Dave, you know, what we do with the debonair ideal segment, I know you've heard it, is we, we really try to connect cigars with those everyday things in, in, in life. Um, all those good things and all those positive things. And, you know, um, one thing I wanted to talk about tonight was music. And I thought it was an appropriate one to do um, because of your what you've done down in Cigar Jukebox. So for our listeners who might not be familiar with uh, Cigar Jukebox, why don't you tell what you're doing um, down there? Yeah, thanks, Will. Well, first, thanks for having me on. Um. First thing, I want to thank Brett Smith, a listener to Cigar Jukebox, for the uh, Atelier ER13 that I smoked. Before I put it away, this is where I'm at with that one. Great cigar. Oh, and I'll be talking a little bit about that later. So just excellent balance, just amazing cigar. But um, with Cigar Jukebox, for people that haven't heard the show, essentially what it is is I do an interview and then I have a review of a cigar, and I match the cigar to a playlist. So the playlist lasts about the burn time of the cigar, and the different songs either connect with flavors or the draw or different aspects of the cigar. And, yeah, so I just, like, some people pair spirits or beer stuff with cigars. I pair music, and that's where it came from. Wow, yeah, and if you've done, like I said, it's a real unique uh program you've done and you've had some celebrity guest DJs um I mean you've on there a couple who are some of the folks who've guest DJed with you well as a matter of fact Will Cooper I um John Huber's come on a couple times uh to guest DJ uh and what a guest DJ does is we each smoke the same cigar before the show and each person picks five songs to go with the cigar and then we go through the songs so John Huber's done a couple. Um, I had Victor from Chowi Cigars come on and do one. Uh, and I'm, it's a cigar that uh, you can get in the Dominican, but it's coming to the U.S. Great um, cigar, by the way. You turned me on to that. That's a great cigar. It is. It's, it's, uh, and I've heard you talk about it on the show, which is really great um, to bring it uh, to people's attention. But, yeah, that cigar should be in the U.S. I mean, he's working on getting it in the U.S., so that'll be good. Um, working on getting Skip Martin on for a guest DJ. Uh, Colin from uh, Twin Engine Coffee. I just did one with him this morning that'll be airing in a couple of weeks. So yeah, it's um, it's a chance to see the different side of some of these cigar makers and, and look at music and how it connects with cigars. And I guess the interesting thing is you kind of get to those stories behind the cigars and, and, and that sort of thing through music, which is fun. Absolutely. And, you know, as a music fan, um, I've always been an album guy. Yeah. Uh, I'm still an album guy. Um, I mean, I'm more of an I, – I grew up listening to album-oriented rock uh, music and, and not necessarily all rock. Um, and I thought tonight for the Debonair Ideal, we, we could talk about some albums. And I, think, I, I wanted to um, – I picked five albums. I asked you to pick five albums. These can connect to cigars. These may not connect to cigars, um, but they, can, you know, again, it's part of those conduits in terms of, uh, you know, I'm in a cigar shop and I know we've had discussions with, with, with fellow smokers about a particular album. Um, so I wanted to talk tonight, you know, just pick five albums. Um, Dave, I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to, we'll wrote, we'll go, we'll alternate on this. Um, I'll ask you to kind of go first. Yeah, no, it's it's great. And as far as debonair, because I listen to debonair deal, nothing's more debonair than like breaking out, you know, your vinyl album of something. That is a very debonair 
thing to do. And one of my favorite albums of all time is uh, Rolling Stones' Let It Bleed. Oh, man. I mean, beginning to end, every track on that album is, well, just a great um, track itself. But the, the key thing with that is, and the key thing with any great album is that the songs build on each other and they make the whole album a good experience. So not just are the songs good in and of them themselves, but when you listen together to them as an album, it's just a, from start to finish, it's a phenomenal album. I mean, when you kick off an album with Gimme Shelter, mm -hmm. which, uh, great, great track on the album, even better when, when the Stones have taken that live. Um, yeah. I mean, I saw one they did with U2 and Fergie at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It blew me away. I mean, that is just, um, it's just, yeah. I mean, and there's just other, you know, great Midnight Rambler is another one I really yeah. love on it. Yeah, so that, that would be like my, my number, my like favorite album of all time. How about you, Will, album wise? Well, I'm going to start off with um, it's an album that actually came out bef uh, the year before I was born. Um, and it's the Beach Boys Pet Sounds. And yes. I'm going to tie this one a little back to cigars in that. It's, you know, I love complexity in a cigar. And what, what Brian Wilson did on that album, um, he kind of moved away from that surfer rock, and he just put together a complex album of complex harmonies, a complex instrumentation. You know, from what I understood, he, he listened to the Beatles' Rubber Soul and, and basically wanted to try to outdo that, right? And then he worked on Pet Sounds. And then, from what I understand, McCartney heard Pet Sounds, and he said, man, I'm going to try to top that one, and he did Sgt. Pepper. Um, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, a lot of what Pet Sounds, what makes that album great, isn't just what they do in front of the mic, but what he did on the boards and producing the album was some of the first, first layering of tracks and complexity you talk about was some of the first stuff done to an album like that. Yeah, I mean, I actually, uh, prepping for this segment, I was watching some stuff on... Um, on, on on YouTube um, on that um, and in particular the song I'm waiting for the day uh, they actually showed how they were layering the different instrumentation on that and how when you when you start separating out the different instruments how it was very different and when they put those big kettle drums in there um, how it just made that a real powerful song and how they were able to kind of switch off between the ballad and then making it a powerful sound um, that album, I'm you, that album is, it never got nominated for a Grammy. I, I'm, I was shocked to hear that it was never nominated for a Grammy. That It's one of the all-time greatest albums. I have a very cool Brian Wilson story that I don't know if it's true because I read it, but I want to think it's true because it's so cool. He was in, um, Brian Wilson, as people know, is very, and the movie just came out a little while ago about him with John Cusack, but he had a very contemptuous relationship with his record label. And he went into a meeting once and he brought in a tape, a tape, audio tape and a tape deck. And on one side he had the, he had the word no recorded. And on the other side he had the word yes. And they'd ask him a question and he would just put the tape in the deck and press play <laughs> for either yes or no. And he wouldn't talk at all. That's uh, my favorite Brian Wilson story. Wow. He would just, I mean pre he would just, <laughs> he would just press this tape deck. To, to talk for him but no i mean just and i think like rolling stone i think it's like the number two or number three album of all time that album so yeah great album yeah i mean like i said it's an album i didn't really appreciate until probably i was about 40 years old um and then went back to listen to it i'm like wow this is just this is just a landmark album i understand why it was rated rated so high so dave what's your yeah. next album well speaking of landmark albums i once on a early cigar jukebox show said that it should be a law that every cigar retailer hands out a copy of this record to people that buy a cigar. And that is Miles Davis with kind of blue. Oh, just great. The thing about Miles Davis and that track or that album was really at that point in his career, because he has a very diverse career, but at that point, what makes that album so great is that the timing on everything is perfect. It, it, when you listen to that album, you listen to like flamenco sketches, for example, and you're like, wow, I could, it could really use some trumpet here. He like hits each note exactly when you want it, and the songs are constructed brilliantly. And that album, 
can like looking at cigars, you can pair that album with anything. That album is just it's amazing. It's a great album, you know. And Miles Davis, you know, late in his career, he did that, um, and it was right before his death. He did an album called Doobop, which he yeah. really and and the stuff he did, he did some he did some sampling in there, um, and I mean, Fantasy is just an incredible uh, song. I mean, I, I believe he sampled some Cool and the Gang and some Casey and the Sunshine Band in there. Um, had he lived, I think he, you know, that might have been. Something, but he was really, I think, in the '90s when sampling became very big, he was really right at the forefront of that. Yeah, I mean, listen, you talk. Well, I gotta have you on for a guest DJ with all this record knowledge. You should be doing cigar jukebox, man. My uh, a little story about why I have the knowledge is uh, my dad owned a, uh, my grandfather actually owned a limo company. My dad inherited it. Um, and uh, long story short, my grandfather uh, was hustling with the limos in the New York. He picked up a, a record executive. Um, he ended up getting the uh, limousine services for CBS Records. Um, and so they had a contract to drive the executives as well as the uh, artists. So, you know, my dad has driven anyone from, he, he got to know Michael Jackson very well. He got to know um, Cindy Lauper very well. Uh, my, my grandfather's a new Teddy Pendergrass, so, uh, you know, I got a lot of exposure to music when I was growing up. My dad eventually uh, dissolved the company. When, when CBS sold to Sony, they didn't continue the contract, so the company got dissolved at that point, and he moved on to something else. But So I had a lot of influence with that. Great. So what's your, what's your second album? Um, this is going to be a surprise to a lot of people, uh, but it's not going to be a surprise to a lot of people. Um, I'm going to pick the soundtrack from Saturday Night Fever. Nice. Uh, you got to understand if there's disco haters out there, I, I, I don't care. But um, you got to say that Saturday Night Fever was filmed in Brooklyn where I grew up. Um, and that album was a soundtrack to really Brooklyn is what I'm just going to say. The whole Brooklyn scene. Um, and... It's there's just I mean not only do the Bee Gees do some great songs on there but there's other artists the Tramps are on there with Disco Inferno, the Tavares were on there, um, Casey and the Sunshine Band even has a uh, even has a Boogie Shoes on there. Um, it, 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 that that album did win the Grammy. It put the Bee Gees on on the map. Uh, I, I'm a I'm a Bee Gees fan. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I love the Barry Gibb falsetto. Um, Travolta is is an icon in my book. I actually got a chance to meet Travolta at an awards dinner I went to my day job. Um, I, I didn't meet him one on one, but he spoke at it. I should say, um, and I got a lot of respect for him. So that album, um, and I know Skip Martin's a closet Bee Gees fan, I believe. <laughs> it's Australia's own man. That's oh yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm even forgetting that as well. That's right. They're Australia's yeah, own. The Gibbs man. That's where they came. They from, came uh... from there, and then they went to England. Yeah. Now I think Barry Gibb lives in Miami Beach, from what I understand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. I was thinking of you. You were talking about that because one of my third album I have on here might be a surprise to some people, but it's a landmark album and one of the best live albums I've ever heard. And that's the Johnny Cash Live at Folsom Prison. Oh. <laughs> that I have that on vinyl, and uh, it is just amazing. It's because you get the crowd going into it and his voice and the different songs like Folsom Prison Blues. I mean, stuff that he wrote like right before the show. You got um, Cocaine Blues on there, which for people that are big cigar geeks, um, which I'm assuming you are because you listen to this show. Yep. If you're a stogie geek, um, that song is sort of the driving force behind the Jericho Hill line. That's right. That's right. The Vitolas, the name of the, the line, all comes from lyrics from Cocaine Blues. So... Um, that Johnny Cash album, that's a great, great album. Live at Folsom Prison. Oh, I, I totally agree. Did you see Walk the Line, the movie? Uh, I did not. I saw some of it. Um, and it's interesting because I saw some of it. I haven't seen the whole thing. But what's interesting about that movie is, um, A, his relationship with Bob Dylan. It kind of touches on, I think, there. And like for some people, Nashville Skyline is another great album. He's on there. But... Um, him and June Carter, and they do track. They do um, tracks on the uh, Folsom Prison album. Those are some of my favorite tracks of their duets. Oh, absolutely! And they they talk a lot about the relationship uh, that movie with Johnny and June, obviously in there. 
Yeah, so, great. So what do you what do you what do you got, Will? Um, gonna now I'm gonna move into the '80s. Um, and I have a couple albums in the '80s, but I'll start off. Um, this album is a, was actually a debut solo album uh, by Sting, and it's called "The Dream right. of the Blue Turtles." Right. And you know, Sting was obviously he had a huge success with the Police. He was coming off a of synchronicity. Um, and he went into the studio with with a uh, a jazz band. Um, and he created this jazz infused rock album in 1985. Um, I, I just, it was, it blew me away how good this album was. Um, it was, it, I mean, it, it was a Grammy nominated album. It didn't win that year, but, um, I mean, everything from, he does, um, they do a, um, they do another version of the police's shadows in the rain. Uh, with that jazz orchestra, which they it's 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 a, it's a high energy version of it with that jazz band, it is and Sting's vocal. It's a totally different spin on that song, but you know there's there's so many uh, great songs. You know from if you love somebody set, set you free um, to fortress around your heart. There's an instrumental a, like a pure jazz instrumental track which Sting plays bass on, which is the title track "Dream of the Blue Turtles." Um, I can't believe that album's 30 years old already. And it was, um, you know, again, you talk about complexity. Um, what I look for in an album, complexity, um, it, just like a cigar. That album has complexity to it. it it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. Yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, he has a very interesting career when you take all the police stuff and then his solo stuff into account. It's a pretty diverse career, really, what he's, what he's accomplished. Really, really, it, I, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, I got to see the police in 2007 um, right. when they kind of got back together. I saw them twice. And they when they toured, they basically rearranged almost all the songs they did. They took a little criticism for it, but for the most part, it was really well received because it was like you got to hear the police together and they still sounded like the police. But there was the, they had this different spin where they just made it different, um, and it was it was fantastic um, to see. I got to see them live in two thousand seven. Um, I don't know if they'll ever regroup again, but it was because because Andy Summers I think is getting close to seventy right now, so I don't know. But again, yeah, I'm a what he did with the Police, and they didn't seem like they lost a beat when they when they were touring. Mm. Well, this uh, next out uh, one of the other albums I have on here. Um, cause I kind of tried to hit a couple different genres. This is now this is album I like to I like to use with cigars that have a lot of body, have a good depth, um, which we'll talk about in some of my stories of the week. But it's Aretha Franklin album, and a lot of cigar people that guest DJ are very surprised when I pick Aretha Franklin for songs. But um, it's an Aretha Franklin album, and the album is Lady Soul, and. What I love about it is her voice is so soulful and it's so it has this sort of sweet yet deep um, vibe to it. And this song, like some of the tracks uh, on this song, have a very love that kind of classic Motown sound like Tom really probably would love this album uh, with that Detroit Motown sound and just a great depth, a great warmth, yet still her her voice is sweet and very uh, has a lot of emotion behind it. And I just, yeah, that Aretha Franklin album is a very good record as well. Did you like Aretha Franklin when she kind of in the mid eighties had another kind of uh, surge in her career? I am very, I'm very Motown Aretha Franklin. Uh -huh. So I, I have this There's another live album um, where she does some stuff. So I, I'm kind of pre eighties Aretha is my main is where I kind of hang out. I would agree, but when Freeway of Love came out, um, it has a little bit of that Motown sound to it. I, I thought it was kind of a little bit of a modern spin, and it's just, it's a kind of a high energy, feel good song. I always really, I mean, again, some of the classic soul stuff she did, not taking anything, but that song Freeway of Love was was a big surprise. How much I enjoyed that song. Again, it's probably about almost thirty years old that song, but great great track in my book. Yeah, and if people are looking for like a modern spin on Motown, that's sort of a big thing now, kind of the resurrection of that sound, because you have um, people like uh, Cody Chestnut does that. Um, you have um, 
Alabama Shakes are a band that kind of has a bit of that Motown in the vocal. So yeah, that's that that sound is kind of coming back with a twist on it as well. Agree. I, I totally agree with you on that. So my so, fourth. So we'll, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You go. Oh no, I was just gonna say, what's your next album? Um, I'm gonna go back to 1985 again. Um, and this album uh, is from probably one of my favorite bands. Um, some may call them a duo, but they were a band for a while. Um, and they they had a long hiatus uh, in the '90s before they kind of reformed. And it's Tears for Fears, songs from the Big Chair. Um, yeah, they yeah that does um, that's some great great tracks on that. Yeah, and so this kind of a different type of complexity this album had. Um, it was. Um, they named the big chair was uh, they got that from the movie Sybil, which dealt with someone with uh, multiple personalities. And the idea with songs from the big chair is they picked uh, they put together a collection of songs that kind of have multiple personalities um, on that on that track. I mean, everyone knows um, shout and everybody wants to rule the world. You know, everybody wants to rule the world. They never quite explain the meaning of it, but if you listen and really analyze that song, I think it deals with the advent of what I call this tabloid journalism. And it comes from, they write that song from a couple points of view. I think they write it from the tabloid journalist point of view and then the subject's point of view. And, you know, you start listening, uh, you know, there's lines in there like one headline, why believe it? Um... You know, I can't stand this indecision. You know, it, it, in that song, it, it, it went number one, I remember. It, it was a song that took me a little while to get into, and then I really, really enjoyed it. But there's some real, there's a, there's a track on there called The Working Hour, which if you're a Tears for Fears fan, it's, it's probably one of the all-time favorites. Some great saxophones they, they uh, implement in there. Um, they had a little more of an electronic sound, I think, with songs in the big chair. And I think when they moved on after that, they got away from that electronic sound to a more natural, with more acoustics on their follow-up albums. But I think what they did, they really, it, I mean, that was a, that was a blockbuster album in the eighties. And I, I just, I still listen to that album today. Is that, is the, is Mad World, is that track on there? Do you know? Mad World was on, one? no, it wasn't on there. It was on Hurting. All right. I love uh, that song. Oh yeah, and you know it's been covered a lot of times. Um, you know, Gary Jules did the cover of that, but yeah, that hurting yeah. album is is an album that's more of a theme album where it deals with hurt and pain. Um, it's a very raw album. Again, a lot of electronic sounds in there, but raw more from the emotion point of view of that album. Um, and you know that album wasn't as successful. I think it became successful when Songs in the Big Chair came out. I think a lot of people went back and and started revisiting the hurting. Mm. Well. My uh, my album here kind of goes out to Skip Martin and uh, some other guys is because uh, I wanted to hit different genres, so I'm in the hip hop genre now. And for me, one of the best hip hop albums out there. And um, I mean, I like current albums like say Roots Undone. I like that album. I like a lot of Run the Jewels. I like them, but I have to go all the way back to Tribe Called Quest Low End Theory. It is kind of East Coast. The, the lyrics in that album are impeccable. Really smart, very clever. Love Tribe Called Quest. One of my favorite bands, if not, you know, hip-hop bands, if not bands ever. I, I would say between that and BC Boys, Paul's Boutique are some of the two of the best hip-hop albums you can get. So if you're into hip-hop, you got to check those out. Yeah, you know, and I just saw, you know, just news-wise... Um you know, hip hop. Drew Estate obviously is doing another collaboration with Shady Records uh, on a cigar next year. Now that yeah, that um, there's a lot of uh, hip hop comes out with a lot of cigars. A lot of guest DJs I have on throw some hip hop out there, and I think it's because, especially when you get to some Nicaraguans and other cigars that have that that spice and those sort of more bold flavors. That percussion and beat in hip hop, that sort of driving force, really connects well with some of those bolder uh, flavors in those cigars and those blends. T totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah, that's a good point. And they, you know, you could say Pete Johnson, what he did with the rock scene, you know, Drew State's doing yep. with the hip hop scene to some extent. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yep. 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 So you got what other albums you got, Will? In your, All right. Uh, like you, this, as you yeah. thumb through your uh, your your wax. Your stacks of wax. 
All right, this is a CD. I don't know if this one came out on vinyl or not. Um, and I'm, I'm going to probably just, people are just going to, their mouths are going to drop when I name the artist. Uh -oh. uh, I'll just name the artist, Madonna. Oh, here we go. I'm, I'm on it. I'm on board. I'm on board. What are okay. we going with here? All right, and this one's going to shock everyone. Uh, the album was a 2000, late 2005, 2006, early 2006 release. It's called Confessions on a Dance Floor. Ah, uh, yes. Let me tell you what, what she did with that album, and here's why she brought back that 70s music sound and created it with a, a modern twist. She brought in a producer by the name of Stuart Price, who was big into, I'd say, more modern electronic music. Um, she, I mean, she sampled a lot of artists in that, on that. You know, she sampled uh, ABBA with um, Gimme, Gimme, uh, Gimme uh, on the song Hung Up. Um, there's a song called Future Lovers, which she samples Donna Summers, I Feel Love in there. Um, there's, a, there's a song called Jump, which is more of an original track that blows me away. Uh, there's a controversial song on there called Isaac, which has more of a, a Hebrew uh, sound to it. Um, a lot of people took offense to it, and I'm not, I just thought it was really, really out of the box. Um, I, I, I'm not a Madonna fan. But when that album came out, I just said, wow, this is, this is something that, you know, is different. It brought me back to that Saturday Night Fever sound of, of New York, Brooklyn. It, it very, I mean, there's even a song on there uh, called I Love New York. It's, it's a different I Love New York compared to the jingle. It's a totally different song, but it's still called I Love New York. It has that. It, it just it brought me back to some of the nightclub scene in New York um, at that time. And it was, it was structured to be kind of a, you could play that album in a, in a, in a, you know, a dance club and it's continuous. So one song kind of feeds into the other with that. Um, I, I love the album. If you, if you, I've never seen her live, but if you watch the concert footage and, and the, the choreography, um, not to mention Madonna looked real good <laughs> in that too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, she, she did perform some of that stuff at the Super Bowl a few years ago. That's not going to give you the, that wasn't a good representation of what she did on that tour. Um, but all that stuff's on YouTube, on her YouTube channel. And, and I, I look like I, I really, really enjoyed it. No, nice, nice. Yeah. No, it's, um, Madonna's like, it's interesting to sort of feeds into my kind of last album. Because it's kind of, I think Madonna, David Bowie, um, people that kind of like are continually um, reinventing their sound, you know, like you listen to Madonna, like you listen to, uh, you know, Lucky Star or something, and then you put on the album you're talking about, and you almost think they're like two totally, two totally different people. It's like Bowie as well; he's constantly like evolving, um, redoing his sound, and the one that I have kind of my last one as I look at my list over here is uh, I have Radiohead and I love Radiohead. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, and good. I have Radiohead. I have OK Computer. Um, and when that came out, it sort of reinvented pop music with the use of electronic. Um, plus, Tom York's voice is so haunting and has this sort of very fragile quality to it. That And that's another band that continually sort of reinventing their sound from like a straight sort of rock to then they went kind of had this electronic with okay computer and this very sort of dystopian look at the future. And now they're kind of coming back with kind of more guitar based stuff uh, now with like uh, in rainbows and stuff. But yeah, Radiohead, okay computer from beginning to end. I love that album. Yeah. Oh, it's a great album. I mean, they really, uh, I mean, they're hall of fame material Radiohead for sure. Mm. I mean, they're going to be in the rock and roll hall of fame. Mm. Any other albums for you, Will? I'm I'm tapped out. I got one more, um, and and this is not because you were just on the show, um, <laughs> but I, I I am a huge fan of this band, um, and um, it's In Excess's Shabu Shabu Shabu, um, which is their third album. Um, now the story with this album is this came out in like 1982, um, and when growing up in New York. Um, if you wanted to get import albums, you had to go into Manhattan. Um, and 
so there, were, there were all the import record stores. That's how you used to get music uh, for folks who were real young. If you wanted to get import music, you had to go to a real – you couldn't go to, like, Sam Goody. Um, you had to go to, like, these, these little shops in lower Manhattan and Greenwich Village. Um, I happened to be in one of these shops, I would, and, and I happened to hear – them playing this uh, Shabu 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 Shuba, um, and I'm like, this is an unbelievable album. And they said, yeah, this band is called In Excess. They they haven't really hit it in the U.S. yet. Um, this is this is like five years before they really hit it big uh, with Need You Tonight and Devil Inside. Um, but this album, um, oh my goodness, um, tr- I mean, there is just some unbelievable they, they have that you know that funky they, they bring a little bit of that funky edge to them um and uh you know they have a song called don't change which they always have closed out their concerts with for um for as long as they did um even after michael hutchins died and and, and when michael hutchins died there ain't that was i know a lot of people kurt cobain and john lennon um but for me when michael hutchins passed it was uh, very, very difficult um, the way he went and stuff. He was just such an enormous talent. Um, they did keep the band going for a while afterwards, but obviously it wasn't this. You can't replace a Michael Hutchins. But that album, um, it's a hidden gem from you guys down under in Australia. It's you know it is available now. You know you can still get it. It's it's uh, not hard to get anymore because they've hit it big. You, know, you get it on Amazon. You can download it. Great album. It's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, and uh, I could just you know hear the people yelling at their monitors right now. But you know, you know, just some other albums: The Beatles with uh, Revolver, great album. The White Album's a good album as well. Uh, Dylan, Highway 61 Revisited. Oh well, yeah, great album. Um, just some great, some uh, great records. I guess for for people thinking of stuff, you know, that's more recent. Um, you have uh, Courtney Barnett who's a Australian singer who just put out an album, which is really good. Uh, the national is a band that I really like that puts out good stuff. Uh, hip hop wise run the jewels. So I think I, I tried to cover a variety of decades in 30 seconds there. Will. yeah, I mean, yeah, no, you did a good job. I mean, I'll throw an honorary one in arcade fires, the suburbs a few years oh. ago. Yep. Yep. Arcade fire. Yep. Well, I, mean, um, yeah. I, I had this talk with, uh, Eric, uh, master sensei, from dojo one of his favorite albums is clash london calling and um we were talking about how music is like cigars in that we could sit here and have this conversation for like three days and there's always good albums that you know we haven't heard of much like with cigars there's always that next cigar they haven't tried yet that's a great cigar so you're always sort of learning more about music and more about records and artists and you can never you can never hear them all it's just which is the great thing about music i think yeah and you know it's interesting i'll close this segment out by just saying you know with um you know obviously we heard it with tom lazuka even just earlier um trademarks are a big issue in the cigar industry it's always something with trademarks and clearly the music industry's had that problem for can you hear me oh yeah yeah i can hear you okay yeah uh, i thought i was mute um yeah the trademark um problems been but the music industry's had probably even a bigger one with that so oh, yeah. yeah so uh with that uh we will take a quick break and come back with our stogies of the week <laughs> 